Okay, state of OpenJDK. Um, the biggest change, as, as I think many of us in this, in this room know by now, um, but I'll just review it quickly anyway, the biggest change in this community in the last two years has been the transition from this old and majestic and slow moving and unpredictable release model where we shipped a release every two or three or five or seven years or whatever it was, uh, to this rapid cadence model in which we ship a, a new feature release every six months, no matter what. The last big elephant was Java 9, JDK 9, shipped in, uh, in, in September of 2017, which seems like it was just yesterday, but it's actually quite a while ago by now. Um, the, the last big release, there were 90 JEPs in this release. Uh, there were two major slips to the schedule. It took three years and six months uh, after, after those slips were accounted for. Um, and that's the, last, that's the last big one. After we shipped 9, we shipped JDK 10 in March 2018 six months later, 11 in September 2018, 12 in March 2019, 13 in September 2019, we'll ship 14 next month, middle of next month, and we'll ship 15 this September, and so on, every six months, like clockwork. A feature release can contain any kind of feature. These are, these are not just old, the, the old updates of the past, right? Um, a feature, it, it can contain a language feature, a VM feature, a library feature, <coughs> Uh, and, and, and so forth. Somehow I have skipped ahead, sorry. Um, but the, the, the important thing that makes this work, the, the reason we've been, been able to be this successful so far with this model is that we no longer put features in before they're finished. A feature can only go in when it's nearly done because we can't afford to slip a release to fix some broken feature. And so it's a new level of discipline but it has a lot of benefit. And with another release just six months away, well, if you're working on a feature and it doesn't make this one, that's okay. You're not, you're not rushing to get something in that's gonna be broken because the next release is, is three or five years out. Uh, so that actually all, all works out fairly well. In the, the, there, there is the question though of, <clears throat> of, of how, how long are these, are these things supported? In the OpenJDK community, we update the current feature release for at least six months. So that's two, two quarterly update release, re releases, they, they, you know, three, three months apart. And then every three years we declare a long-term support release. So 11 is the first long-term support release, 17 is the next one. If you like, you can think of eight up there as, as the previous long-term support release. Each of these LTS releases will be updated well past the beginning of the next LTS release and possibly even longer, you know, depending upon what the maintainers in OpenJDK decide to do. Now, you might think that the non-LTS releases are in some way experimental. They're just fancy beta releases. It's, you know, it's really just early access. Uh, but they're not. Every one of these releases is production ready. What differs is only the support timeline. Speaking of, of updates, where do you get them? You can get updates from a variety of providers, including Oracle. Oracle ships OpenJDK builds under the GPL for the first six months of each feature release the GA release plus, plus two updates, whether it's LTS or not. After that, Oracle offers long-term support builds, but unlike in the past, they're not free. They're available under a commercial license that allows free use in development and production, but requires uh, payment for use in production. Sorry, free use for develop, development and testing. Let me get this right. However, that doesn't mean you have to pay Oracle for Java update releases because Java is still free. All the code is still under the GPL, and even though Oracle engineers aren't contributing to the OpenJDK long-term long support releases anymore, other contributors under the leadership of Andrew Haley, standing back there, there um, are continuing um, the, 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 the fine LTS work that they've been, been doing for many years in the OpenJDK community. As a result, you can get carefully built, well-tested JDK LTS builds in almost any Linux distro. If you're not using Linux, you can get builds from a variety of providers. So we've transitioned to this new release model, big change, but what have we actually delivered since Java 9? Well, it turns out we've delivered quite a lot. JDK 10, Java 10, contained 12 jobs. We were actually worried a little bit going into it. Okay, it was only six months after nine. What, you know, what, if, the re what if the release has no, has no significant features in it? Uh, well, it, it turned out it was actually pretty rich. We had a new GC interface. 
Um, we had uh, an actual language feature, local variable type inference, var for Java, but it's not dynamic typing, don't worry. Um, a massive refactoring of the source code into a single mercurial repository, which, uh, which was a, a long-term play that's, that's paying, paying additional benefits now. Uh, when I, as I go through these lists, the, the items in orange, just for reference, are from non-Oracle contributors. <clears throat> okay, that's 10. 11 contained 17 JEPs. There's a new HTTP client API, uh, the ability to launch single file source code programs, TLS 1.3, the Epsilon garbage collector, low ho overhead heap profiling, and a bunch of other stuff. Java 12, JDK 12, eight JEPs, including the Shenandoah garbage collector, the microbenchmark suite for the JDK, the first preview language feature, switch expressions. I'll talk a bit about, about these later on and also what a preview feature is. JDK 13 was a little thin, only five JEPs, but it did contain another preview language feature, text blocks. <clears throat> a little on the small side, but 14 is going to make up for it with 16 JEPs, a whole bunch of good stuff in here. Um, pat pattern matching, another, another language feature in preview, packaging tool, a JFR event streaming, streaming non-volatile mapped byte buffers from Andrew Din, helpful null pointer exceptions from Gutz Lindenmeyer, records, switch expressions, again, deprecate the Solaris and Spark ports. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> Remove the concurrent mark sweep gar garbage collector. Bye-bye. <laughs> ZGC improvements. Remove the PAC 200 tools and API. Bye. And foreign memory access API from, from Maurizio and company. Um, so this is, this, all this is still in development, but we are really winding down. We're in ramp down phase two. Uh, we hope to have the first release candidate build next week. If you'd like to help out, you can get builds here. Please download them, test them, and if something is, is, is really wrong, let us know. Okay, that's 14. Well, 15. 15 repos open, zero JEPs so far. There, there will be some. You know, so far it's you know, routine bug fixes, small enhancements that, 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 that don't deserve a JEP and so forth. Uh, but builds for this are available too. We started shipping them in December. If you really want to be on the bleeding edge, this is the place to go. So one of the main questions that people had about the new release model is, the, will the non-LTS releases be adopted? Are people just going to move from Eight to eleven to seventeen and so forth, and and just and just skip all these non-LTS releases. So, in in the interest of gathering data, I would like to do some polls. This will also help you help you wake up if you're still jet lagged as I am. Okay, I we, I we we often see see people do polls on Twitter, you know, el elsewhere on on the web uh, about usage. And one of the things that I always find disappointing is they'll just ask, well, are you using version X? But they don't distinguish between production and development, which are very different things. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask pairs of questions. Um, how many people are using a release earlier than eight in production? I know of people who say. Okay, he's, he's a proxy for a lot of people. Okay, uh, well, I, I guess it, it, it's nice that there aren't too many hands. How many peop are people are using a version earlier than eight in development? Oh, that's just. No, you, <laughs> I mean, not, not because you're maintaining it. <laughs> okay. How many people, are, people are, are using eight in production? Okay. Eight in development. Eh, okay. That's a, a, a fair number of people, but, but fewer than are using it in production. So that's, take that as a positive sign. How many people are using 11 in production? Nice. That's maybe a third of the room. How many people are using 11 in development for future stuff? And that's maybe half of the room, almost. Excellent. How many people are using 13 in production? OK. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know, six, eight. Excellent. Good on you. How many people are using 13 in development? OK, a few more, maybe a couple dozen. How many people are using 14 in production? <laughs> One, two, <laughs> it's not GA yet. <laughs> Use at your own risk. How many using 14 in development? Yeah, well, of course. Okay, how many using 15 in production? <laughs> the, 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 this man has many scars on his back. Okay, thank you. Um, that's, that's useful and, and actually encouraging information. And, it, and it's consistent with um, some anecdata that we've seen at Oracle. 
Uh, another thing I'm always skeptical and a little bit disappointed about is when people quote download numbers as, as a measure of popularity. Uh, but here, I'll go ahead and do it. But understanding it's anecdotal data, take it, take, it for, 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 you know, take it as you will. Maybe it doesn't mean much. But uh, on the, the download statistics we've seen for the, the builds that Oracle publishes, you know, GPL or otherwise, we have seen an uptick in downloads for 12 and 13. So it could be a sign of you know there's there's a, a bit of a bit of a takeoff here. People are realizing oh once you once you get get from eight to eleven you know, once you get past nine basically, it is easier to move forward on these six months <laughs> six month feature releases. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and take a closer look at a few of the features delivered since eleven um, and some of the features still in the pipeline. I, I I would like to try to tempt you here to move past eight. You know, at least get to 11, and and after that, move 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 forward from that. But before we look at specific features, let's first consider uh, for a moment how, how is it that we decide what features to add, add to add to Java? Um, you know, is this a popularity contest? What what drives Java forward? And it really comes down to two things. For almost 25 years, that that'll be 25 years this May, by the way. Java has been driven by two big goals. One is developer productivity, making developers more productive, helping developers build and maintain large and reliable programs. Java is not about one-off scripts. Um, it's really about building things for the long haul and being able to maintain them for the long haul. The other big goal for 25 years has been program performance. Of course, performance we measure in many ways, you know, you know startup time, latency, throughput, etc. We measure space, both static and dynamic, and we measure scalability. Uh, from you know I iPhones iPhones to big iron Java is meant to span to span all of these. We pursue these two goals in the face of constantly changing factors, including new programming paradigms such as mixed functional and object oriented programming, evolving applications, big data and machine learning. You know who was thinking about this? You know and certainly not in Java 25 years ago. Um, evolving deployment styles to to clouds and to app stores. You know the, this is no longer the er the era of of, of Java Web Start, really, uh, to, to say nothing of the Java plugin, <coughs> may it rest in peace. Um, and, and of course, there's also evolving hardware. You know, we, have, we have machines these days with terabyte memories and deeper memory hierarchies, uh, vector and SIMD instruction sets, and deeper and more numerous processor pipelines. So, goals, challenges. In that context, let's look at some of the major active projects in the OpenJDK community. All right. <clears throat> we start with Amber, right sizing language ceremony. This is a project being led by Brian Getz, has already delivered a number of features. Loom, virtual threads and scalable concurrency, being led by Ron Pressler. Uh, we'll talk about, talk about that a bit, a bit more later on. Panama, new foreign function and foreign data interface, being led by Maurizio Chimadamore, who's here somewhere. Oh, hi, sorry. Uh, and Valhalla, big project to bring value types and specialized generics to the platform, being led by Brian Getz and John Rose. So let's start with Amber. Amber is squarely aimed at the pain point of, of Java just requiring too much ceremony. Just, you, you have to write too much boilerplate to get things done. The solution that Amber proposes is, is, not is not to re reduce boilerplate exactly, but rather to introduce a series of language features delivered over time that work synergistically with each other that let you express more clearly what you mean. Uh, and that, in, in, in the end, will wind up reducing the boilerplate. Okay, let's go through, through uh, a, a few of these. Um, Brian covered some of these last year. I'm going to go, go through them pretty quickly. Suppose you have an enum for days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. And suppose you want to compute the length of the day of, of, of each day. Now you could, you could cheat and do that by invoking two string and string length, but we're not going to do that in the case of this example. We're going to write a switch statement. Um, you switch on the case, you assign to the sum letters variable, uh, you have a default. Um, all, all kinds of stuff can go wrong here. 
you know, right? You, you can forget a break statement, fall through to the next one. You can forget to assign. You can you can you can forget the default. In this case, you don't actually need it because this is complete. Um, as 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 Brian likes to say, this isn't the language helping you out. It's the language daring you to make a stupid mistake. Because well, I, you think about this conceptually. We're just computing an expression, so let's write it that way for heaven's sake. And with switch switch expressions, expressions you can. There's an additional benefit since, in this case, the compiler can deduce from the enum declaration that you've covered every case. You don't have to put in a default. Now, if it can't deduce that, it will insist that you put in default in a in a default. But in this case, you don't. So switch expressions were first introduced in Java 12 as what we call a preview feature. So a preview feature is a feature that's 98, 99% done, but we want to take one or, or possibly you know, two, two of the six month release cycles to make sure that it's really baked before we totally commit to it. So to use a preview feature, you have to specify enable preview on both the, the Java C command line and the Java Launcher command line. If you don't do that, you will get a helpful error message explaining to you, hey, it's preview feature. You know, sorry, you, you, need, you need to be aware that you're using this because we don't want you to you know, make a commitment to something that could change in the future. So that for, first previewed in 12, uh, it previewed again in 13. We got some feedback from the 12 preview uh, that su suggested we should make one small change. So we made that small change, re-previewed it in 13. In 14, it is now final, and you no, no longer need the enable preview option in order to use it. All right. If you want to see, if you if you're if you're curious about the history of all this, you can actually read the JEPs, right? Here, here's the first first preview JEP, 325. The second preview JEP, 354, and then the final um, standard, 361. And 361 it has a section down here about the about the history. It, it, it explains what 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 has changed, what hasn't changed, and so forth. Okay, let's look at another Amber feature: text blocks also known as multi-line string literals, a feature people have been asking for for many, many years. We've all had to write code you know, like this. Maybe you weren't emitting HTML, but you were, you were doing something. You needed a string that ha had multiple lines in it. So you do the, the you know, double quote, you know, backslash n plus thing. Uh, if you've got quotes in your, in your string, you need to remember to, to quote the quotes themselves and with backslashes. Uh, and, it, it, and it's all kind of clunky. So with text blocks, you can just write that. Triple quotes borrowed from you know, Python and other languages. Uh, the, the details of this are, it, it actually turned out to be quite, quite sophisticated um, in order to, ma to make it intuitive to use. The, the sort of obvious interpretation of this would be, okay, this is a string, it's got multiple lines in it, there'll be a new, new line after each one, and there'll be all these spaces before each line. But of course, that's probably not what you want. You probably want this angle bracket to be in the first column. So the, the, this feature is specified very carefully to let you ignore that, and it will find the common prefix of white space ahead of all of your lines and remove them so that you get you know, what, what it was that you almost certainly intended. Now, if you really do need to indent, there's a new convenience method on the string class that will, that will let you indent. Uh, text blocks previewed uh, first in 13. Uh, we get, got some feedback, changed them a little bit in 14. They're still in preview mode. Uh, they will pr almost certainly be final in 15. So if you're curious about them, check them out and let us know if we missed something else in this feature. Moving right along, a feature that Brian, Brian didn't mention last year. We've all written plain old Java objects. You have some fields, you have a constructor with the obvious obvious parameters, does the assignment into the fields, you have some accessors, and what did I forget on this slide? Hmm? Equals and hash code. And? Two string. And two string, yes. Oh, right, okay, I gotta write those. Okay, type, 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 type. Or tell your IDE to write them for you, and hopefully the IDE gets them right. Um, the IDE can make it easier to write, but it can make it easier to read, right? If you, if you go change some, some of the code that your IDE generated, and you come back a year later, you have to go make sure that is that actually right because, well, you changed it, whatever. Um, it's, it's easy to cut corners. You know, plenty, plenty of people, I, I, I will confess, I, I will occasionally write a POJO in some you know, quickie code, and I don't write equals hash code into string because I'm, you know, I'm just lazy. Um, 
And all, all the encapsulation of the class machinery here is, is just not necessary, right? This is just a holder for data. We, ju we just need a way to say that. And we can do that now with records. So a record declaration replaces all that stuff that's now in gray with that. You just, you just write record point, double X, double Y, curlies, you're done. Because sometimes data is just data. We, we don't, need, don't need a whole class. Now, you can customize records. Maybe you want your own hash code because you, 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 you have a different favorite prime number. OK, fine. Maybe you want to, to add additional methods. So it's a point. Maybe we want, we want to compute its norm, so we can do that. Uh, you can write, you write a constructor if you want. Implicit field initialization, uh, initialization happens first. And then you can check, you know, are, 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 your invariant, are your incoming invariants you know, true or not, and throw an exception. What you can't do is add more state. Right? If you try to add a new field, you will get a, a compile time error because that would via, you know, adding, adding more state would violate the invariant that a record is meant to be a transparent holder for data. Records are immutable. This is you know, sort of a nudge towards functional programming, which is generally a pretty good thing. But you know, if that doesn't work for you, that's OK. You can still write a, a POJO class. Those, those still work. We're never going to take those away. Uh, records are in preview now in Java 14, JDK 14, so you can check them out and play with them. All right, last feature, and th this one Brian, di Brian did mention. Here's another, another pile of code, the sort of thing that many of us have written many times. You've got some object of, of, uh, of unknown type other than object. You want to test whether it's an integer, a double, or a point, and, uh, and, and create a, a nice you know, string string describing what, what exactly it is. And each one of these is this really clunky thing. You test whether ob is an inst instance of integer. Oh, it is. OK, int i, and you cast it to integer ob. And it's, OK, this is tedious. Um, pat with pattern matching, you can write this. So a pattern match, it, it, this is, this is enha an enhancement to instance of. You ask whether ob is an instance of, of integer, so it does a type test um, or a pattern test. If that's true, then it binds i, which is of type integer, to object and does the cast implicitly. So now i is an integer object. You can pass it to string format, and your code just got much more readable. Now, another cool thing is, is the destructuring. For you, you have a point, it will actually destructure x and y. You can type x and y here rather than, um, rather than having to, to dissect it as a point and, and use its accessor methods. So patterns are in preview in Java 14. Um, unfortunately, no, no destructuring yet. It's, there, it's just simple, simple type tests, but there's a long-term plan to enhance this with destructuring and so forth. All of the AMBER features are designed to synergize with each other. Uh, eventually, patterns will play well with switch expressions. So you'll be able to write something like this, which is actually quite nice. OK, that's a selection of features from Amber. Let's move ahead. So I could say, I could say whatever, whatever I wanted about Amber because Brian isn't in the room. Uh, for the rest of the things I'm talking about, there are ex experts in the room uh, who will please correct me if I get something wrong or stupid. So let's move on to Loom. Uh, virtual threads and structured concurrency being led by Ron. Uh, and I will actually, at this point, switch computers. And hopefully the AV system will keep up because I am going to do some demos. Always excited. Thank you for the sound effects, George. Okay. Cool. I love it when things work. All too rare in this business. Okay, and for this, I'm going to sit down, but I'm still in camera range. I'm just, I'll just be at the edge. Okay, so let's look at Loom. Whoops. Here I've got a very recent build of the Loom repo, in this case from GitHub. Ooh, fancy. Um, let's, let's go into JShell and poke around a bit. So we've all written thread code. 
equals new thread. Thread, come on, Mark. Just use a little lambda here. Got a thread, start it, it prints high, and I'm done, and you know this thread thread is still still sitting around. So Threads in, threads in Java, where you know, there, there were kind of this 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 uh, interesting feature feature of the time. That not uh, 25 years ago, not that many many popular platforms actually had threads, but a lot of people needed threads. And one of James Gosling's observations was, "Oh, well, we should give them threads, uh, but we'll do it in you know in a in a nicer nicer language than say C or something." So, a, a thread in Java um, for Maybe not 25 years, maybe 23 years, <laughs> has corresponded to an operating system thread. So that has benefits in that, well, it's a nice clean abstraction, it's easy to understand, it's easy to relate to what's going on in the under underlying system, but they're expensive to create. Uh, they're, they're, they, they take a lot of memory. A thread by default comes with like a megabyte stack in, you know, outside of the Java heap, plus some significant space in the Java heap. They're exp it's expensive to switch context. You can spend a, a couple of thousand instruction cycles, you know, on the order of, of a millisecond or two on a modern processor, you know, switching between threads. Um, it, because they're expensive, because they're slow, it's slow to switch across them. For high performance, people tend people who really want the, the best performance for some, something like like a, a web server, will turn to non-blocking I/O APIs or async frameworks or reactive frameworks. Which can indeed get get very high performance, but they're difficult. It's difficult to write programs that use such frameworks. It's difficult to, to debug such programs, and it's difficult to profile such programs. As a result, a lot of people don't bother with that, and servers wind up being underutilized. So, one of the principal features of the the principal feature of Loom, I, I would say, is uh, is virtual threads. So, for a long time, we called these fibers, and you know, the, we we weren't sure. We're, are, are fibers going to be threads? Are threads going to be fibers? What's the relationship between these two? And Ron and Alan and, and, and other folks went through a long series of prototyping efforts, a uh, long, long series of design analyses uh, to try to figure this out, and uh, finally decided last fall, OK, it, it, there's a certain attraction to making fibers be something new and shiny and clean and not saddled with all the baggage of a thread, but that would, that would not accommodate all that existing code out there that uses thread. So we decided, okay, fi fi fibers are no more. I mean, the, the mechanism is, is still there, but now they're called virtual threads. They use the Java Lang thread API, but they don't have all the baggage. baggage. They don't take all the space. So that, that's where we are. Let's create a virtual thread and see how that works. Um, thread, the thread class uh, in, in, in this build now has a builder. You can request a, a virtual thread I'm going to give it a task, which is the same task I had before. And let me just go ahead and start that. And it does its thing. It prints high. And then I get back this, this T now is a, is a virtual thread. Um, it's now terminated. But before it actually ran, it printed no carrier thread. So a, a virtual thread is virtual because it's not always associated with an operating system thread. It is scheduled by the runtime environment, by, by, by the Java libraries, you know, in actual Java code, um, and, 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 and swi swi switched in, in that context as well. So when a virtual thread, thread needs to run, it's assigned to an OS thread. And then when, it, when it's done or when it, when it needs to block, it's, it's, un it's you know, unassigned, demounted from that OS thread. And that OS thread is used for some other virtual thread. Now the terminology is maybe a little weird because I mean all of this stuff is virtual, right? I mean an OS thread is that's not a real thing; <laughs> it's just bits in memory. <laughs> but anyway, a virtual thread is more virtual than a kernel, than a, than a, than a kernel thread. There you go. Um, you, you can switch amongst virtual threads in you know, very quickly uh, in nanoseconds rather, rather than a microsecond or two. Uh, they're smaller; they're only a few hundred bytes. They're, they're, their stacks grow and shrink as needed. Uh, they don't uh, they don't take up uh, space unnecessarily. Uh, as a result, you can write simple, simple synchronous code that is just as efficient as asynchronous code. Uh, but of course, since it's synchronous, it's far easier to read. You don't wind up in, you know, continuation hell or or these you know, reactive frameworks where you know, one thing happens over here and eventually it happens over there and you can't tell what's going on at runtime. 
All right, a quickie demo here. Um, let's take a look using my favorite IDE. <coughs> In Java. Sleep service. So this is a, a, a little, de little demo that, that Alan wrote. It's this, it's this trivial little REST service using, uh, using JAX-RS. It, it, it responds to this endpoint. Uh, it's called sleep. What does it do? Well, you, you, you go into, hit, into this, if nothing specified, it'll sleep for 100 milliseconds. Uh, it just does its sleep and returns. You know, that, you know, pretend that sleep is an actual you know, blocking I.O. operation or, or something. So let's run that with kernel threads. Using using the, this uh, Vegeta load generator to, to to pound it a little bit, it's running for five seconds and then actually testing for ten. We'll do that. It's going to generate a graph for us. Here are the response times. Now that's that's pretty ugly. So. We, we, we expect no response time under 100 milliseconds, right? Because it's sleep, because it's kind of implementing, it's simulating some blocking operation. But then these response times are like all over the map. We've got some that are over a, over a second long because these, you know, these threads are, are expensive. It's expensive to switch amongst them. Uh, and so that's, that's not very good performance. Let's run this again, but this time we will use virtual threads which it turns out is really easy because the Jetty web server is configured by actual Java code rather than a pile of XML. And all we had to do was go down to its defini definition of, of its thread pool and use, use a virtual thread factory to create the thing. So make virtual, we'll let that run. Okay, let's reload the graph. Now it's actually kind of hard to see, so I'll zoom in a bit. The orange is the response time with virtual threads. It starts out a little high, probably because Hotspot's compiling stuff. Um, but there are a couple of blips, probably for GCs, but as you can see, the response time is almost always just barely above. 100 milliseconds, a, hu a huge improvement. So that's virtual threads in performance. Um, I, I, I said that virtual thre threads are also easier, I mean, just, just e easier to deal with. A good example of that is just a couple of days ago, the team got working. Um, some some Java, Java flight recorder events, you know, showing the, the activity you know, going on in, in, a, in, a, in a Java with, with Loom inside it. Let me zoom in a bit. And the important thing to note here is you can actually see, so here, here is this, 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 you, this co code, is, code is running along in this test. It gets to a read of a socket input stream and, and, it, and it blocks, right? This is, a virtual, this is a virtual thread blocking. If you had written, this is a virtual thread blocking, but in effect, it's doing non-blocking I.O. under the covers because that virtual thread gets parked, the OS thread is used for something else, and, mm -hmm. and the scheduler will, will come back to it when this read completes. But you get a nice stack trace because what you wrote was sequential code, and now you can debug it, and now you can get statistics you know, such as the um, total amount of time spent on I.O. per port. If you were using uh, an, an async or, or reactive framework, you would not be able to get any of this information because it doesn't really exist. So that's a big improvement. All right, moving right along. Panama, foreign function and foreign data interface. We, we, all, we all know, I, I, I suspect, that the, the pain of JNI, um, it's, it's, it's just painful. You have to write C code. You have to compile it into a shared object. You have to tell the Java runtime where that shared object wound up. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's just a pain, so we're going to make it better. Um, okay, so pa Panama is is, is a, a new Java foreign bridge. There there are essentially three parts to it. There's a Java API for low level memory access, which Maurizio will cover later today in detail. I'm not going to talk much about that. 
Uh, there's an extraction tool called JExtract that transforms C and C++ header files into Java interfaces that use that API. And then there's a, a, a runtime binding mechanism that synthesizes implementations of those interfaces. Okay, so let's look at a quick example. We are probably all familiar with getpid, the simplest possible Unix system call. You, in, you invoke it, it returns your process identifier uh, as, as an int. Um, you know, suppose we want to read this, you know, in, invoke this, you know, from Java. Okay, yeah, I know the API has essentially a getpid method, but we're gonna we're gonna do this anyway. Uh, what we can do is run jextract, uh, and I need to pass it. No, I don't need to pass it anything. Unistandard.h contains the definition of getpid. It's using incubator modules, which are kind of like preview feature, but not quite. Uh, we got some source files out of it, and if we look at um, that file, that actually looks kind of familiar. A bunch of the stuff that you would find that you find in unistandard.h, including getpid right here. So for getpid, we it, it, it defines a method handle, which can be useful. More importantly, it defines a, a static getpid method that goes and invokes some runtime machinery to actually cause this cause this. Uh, to take place. All right. Make sure we have the right build here. Yep, built a couple of days ago uh, with a, a last minute fix from Rizio. Thank you. Uh, let me run. Actually, first I need to compile. And since this is an incubator module, I have to add it explicitly. It's not included by default. So I compile that, the stuff in GenSource, I get some classes out of it, and now I will use the source file launcher, one of the undersung features of the platform these days. Foreign, um, uh, but first I should show you getpid.java. That would be brilliant. It's really simple. It invokes unistandard.h, get pid, boom, done. And for reference, we'll use the actual Java API to print out the process ID. We run this, and what happens? Boom, it gets the process ID. That was so much easier than JNI, yay. Okay. So, that's Panama. How much time do I have left? About eight minutes, thank you. Uh, let's move on, finally, to Valhalla, value types, and specialized generics. Valhalla is, is motivated by this. 25 years ago, <coughs> processors com common at the time <clears throat> had maybe one level of cache, and if you missed in that cache, the penalty might be a eh, hundred, couple hundred instructions, no big deal, right? Modern processors, including the processor in this laptop, uh, have like three levels of caches, and if you miss in the third level cache, you're probably gonna, you, your processors are gonna sit around for a couple thousand instruction cycles waiting for that cache miss to be serviced. So the cost of a cache miss has, has increased significantly. Why, why does that matter to Java? Well, Java, as we all know, object-oriented language, right? What do you get in an object-oriented language? You get pointers, you get objects, and, and the objects contain pointers to other objects, and you, you follow a pointer from one object to, the next, to, to another, and another pointer from, to another object, and you, you do that enough times, eventually you will blow out your cache, uh, and you know, basically you know, cache misses lead, lead to slow performance, and slow performance leads to pain, and pain leads to suffering, oh, yeah, we know that. Um, so chasing all those pointers is costly. There are some, one of the reasons there are so many pointers in Java is because every Java object has identity. Right, you can always distinguish you know, w w w you know, one, one object from another, which is generally a good thing. Every object has state. Every object has potentially a synchronization monitor. You can synchronize on any object. Why? Oh, well, because. Um, how useful is that? Far from clear, but you can. Um, so this, this gets really painful, especially when you've got tons of data, like in, like in a big data app or something. So we think the missing abstraction here is, is, is what we call value types or inline types. That's the, the ability to declare 
pure data aggregators that don't need to have identity, but still consider them as being defined by, by a Java class. As John Rose likes to, likes to say, if we get this right, you'll be able to code like a class, but it'll work like an int. And that enables you know, cool stuff like allocation. You can a allocate an object in, in processor registers. And if it never needs to hit the heap, it'll never heat the, hit the heap. But it'll still work mostly like an object. And furthermore, data structures can be flattened. Uh, you know, and that reduces pointers. So quick example, let's multiply some matrices. What one does? All right. Source main Java Valhalla, we've got a complex class. Woohoo. Someday, we, I, I, I wanted to write this as a record, obvious thing, right? But records aren't yet in the Valhalla repo. They'll be merged probably sometime soon. Complex class has you know, real and imagine, imaginary. You can add them, you can multiply them, uh, and so forth. The actual benchmark here, whoops. Sta standard cubic algorithm for mu multiplying. You know, wrote, you, you go down the, the rows and the columns, point-wise, multiplication, addition, you, you get, get the result matrix. Um, and this is structured as a Java micro benchmark harness using Alexei Shipilev's uh, very fine tool. So there are some annotations telling it what to do. Uh, let me run this now uh, with, you know, you know, just using, using no, norm, normal, normal, normal Java code, nothing special go, going on here. I'm going to multiply some matrices together. JMH will measure them. We do some warm-up iterations. Yes, I should have done the demo. <clears throat> so it's multiplying matrices here, but uh, this my, my laptop's not working very hard. You, you, you can't really hear a fan or anything. Silence, right? So deathly silence. There's a reason for that, which we will see in a moment. Okay, let's uh, whoops, go back into Emacs and look at that log. Okay, at the top of this log, we have the uh, usual warning from, from Alexei. You know, think hard about your numbers. Uh, don't want don't to make stupid conclusions. So multiplying, we are uh, clocking in at 1,133 milliseconds per multiply. Each one of those multiplication operations is allocating, um, whoops, almost two gigabytes, because it's making a lot of complex numbers, and those are read-only objects, and there are arrays and arrays and uh, arrays pointing to arrays, and, and, and those arrays are, are pointing to complex objects. And instructions per cycle, very very interesting metric. Is, is barely over one. So the processor in this machine is, is, is an Intel Skylake. It's, it's capable, theoretically, of retiring four instructions per cycle. But the processor is spending most of its time waiting around from the memory subsystem, so it's only retiring a, a little over one instruction per cycle. <coughs> go back to the complex class and, one, and make one very simple change. Public inline class complex. So this is now an inline class, what formerly was called the value type, which means when you have an array of them, Rather than having an array of pointers to complex objects, you have an array of complex numbers all represented in that array as the real and imaginary pairs right there with no pointer to chase. We'll run this again. Now remember the number from last time was a bit over 1,000 microseconds per multiply. Now we're down to about a tenth of that. I mean, these are the warm-up iterations, but um, you can see it's quite a bit faster. And as this progresses, the CPU is working harder, as we can tell by listening to the fan. You hear that? Ooh. So it's not wasting as much time in the memory subsystem. And I am now, out, oh, I have one minute. Just do the quickie log thing. <coughs> we go to the end. Here's our time, 132 instructions per cycle. 
we're getting two and a half, quite a bit better. And if we do a quick division here, 132, eight, eight and a half times faster. Not bad. Okay, so that's features. You can get builds for, for many of these things uh, at jdk.java.net. So please you know, do test them out. Don't believe a word I've said, and thank you very much. <laughs>